Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Carol and Good Zach. Morning. And the first day was uh, great from a TV and moderating every standpoint. So I'm looking forward to today, and I'm happy I get to kick this one off. Um, and let me start with a confession. Yeah. Uh, I only moved to the US less than three years ago. It was the first time I've ever had to write a check. <laughs> I never thought that I wouldn't be able to tap my card so often. <laughs> I, I grew up in Canada, but I spent most of my working career in China, Singapore, um, even in the UK. And when I moved here three years ago, I was shocked by a lot of things, much of it the banking system. Um, opening up, I, I couldn't get a credit card even, which I know I couldn't do in China either, but it was remarkable to go from Asia over here and see the way that things worked and to go from, you know, a society that was going towards cashless at a much quicker pace. Um, Carol, let's start with you. How are things different in China? And tell me a little bit about how Alipay and Ant Financial came to be. Sure. Uh, so Alipay came to be in 2004 as part of a uh, as part of really helping uh, merchants and small and, and consumers really to meet each other through Alibaba's e-commerce platform. So it was a trusted service based on really enabling kind of um, trust and as an escrow service to enable commerce to transpire between suppliers and consumers. Um, and so that's where it originated. And then in 2014 um, is where Ant Financial, as we hear a lot about now, is Ant Financial was kind of the over um, the layer over Alipay and a slew of services that we now have across insurance and wealth management and um, mobile wallets across Asia. You travel back and forth often yeah. between here and China. What is that like? Do you just like leave your wallet at home when you go over to China and just bring your phone with you? Mm -hmm. So there's an article in, um, in China, uh, I don't know, six months ago or so, where there were two uh, gentlemen that tried to hold up at like a a convenience store and there was no cash in the register <laughs> literally so, uh, so yeah I mean you you everything is done on the phone on the mobile wallet using QR codes using QR codes also I just want a quick raise of hands who has been to China and tried to buy something okay so we do have a lot of people I, cause I can see heads shaking saying yes it's crazy right <laughs> um, you know where we're coming from so Zach for you in sort of the crypto world um, how do you see things? How, do you, how are payments different mm -hmm. um, in Asia yeah, than they sure. are? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, it's true about uh, Alipay, where when you go to China, um, I've been there many times. I've, I've lived there for a few years. So um, the last time I was there, I actually forgot that I'm supposed to pay with Alipay or, or another payment system. So I actually took out my Visa card or MasterCard and, um, in McDonald's, and the waitress actually looked at me. And then she had to take out the POS machine and then plug it in and then <laughs> fire it up. So I think that's the scenario uh, in, in many parts of Asia. So what we are doing is that um, some people know us as a crypto company, a blockchain company. But in fact, uh, we go before a blockchain, whereby we try to serve a 250 million uh, population market, Indonesia, whereby there's about 30% uh, bank account ownership a 10% uh, card ownership. So only 10% of the population has either a debit or a credit card. So our, our objective in that market uh, initially was to allow people to have a credit card or a bank account uh, through a different means, uh, maybe via a different um, um, strategy. And we found that uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency allows us to do that. So we have a point of sale system and also uh, a bank card whereby it's tapped on ramp uh, to the crypto um, uh, channels. Now, if you were here yesterday, there was a lot of talk about blockchain. And well, I think you know everyone is a believer in the technology. The uptake has been slower to take off. Is that what you're seeing in Asia also or internationally? So the use cases for blockchain. There was a lot of conversation yesterday on that for sure. Uh, so, but it's, you know, it's really based on like what is the application and there's a slew of applications actually, use cases for blockchain. So one of the things that I find just fascinating is, um, for example, you, we, you can walk into a store, a Hama store in, for example, in China and you could scan a, a code and you could see exactly where that 
cucumber or those vegetables, whatever came from. And so you could go back to see origination of that particular product um, to really, you know, tr product traceability using the blockchain, which is really important when you're. So that is in place. Oh, completely already. in place. And then you could also use it to track, there's a lot of crimes um, with uh, charitable giving, for example, right? And so to also be able to use a blockchain for a use case like tracing to make sure of where the money goes to the intended recipient at the end. And so, um, so that is definitely um, in place. Or also one of the things that um, we've done um, in using the blockchain is we've done um, the world, the first wallet to wallet remittance. So for example, we use the blockchain to do remittance between our wallet in Hong Kong, Alipay Hong Kong, to our wallet in the Philippines, which is the Gcash. And so, and that's all done on the blockchain almost instantly. Is that almost instantly? That's it funny, is. I don't if anyone remembers yesterday, I can't remember who it was, was saying the fastest way to take cash if, to job. a different country is to put it in a suitcase, jump on a plane and go somewhere. So this is another thing that Ant Financial is already doing. That's right, and we also, um, are now doing it through our wallet in Malaysia, so that's touch and go digital, um, through our wallet in Pakistan, which is um, Easy Pesa with Telenor, and so same thing. So that's using the blockchain to do a wallet to wallet remittance almost instantly at no cost, and, or it is instant, no cost. So those are, these are all examples of use cases on the blockchain that are solving a need that is very much in, in place today. Zach, why aren't we seeing that kind of disruption here yet? What are the obstacles? Um, I think based on my experience, um, that's an analogy that um, because about 15 years back, uh, there was a conversation about why U.S. is lagging in uh, the mobile phone uptake. So uh, why aren't um, U.S. market adopting the mobile phone as fast as uh, the other markets? Um, but then U.S. actually leapfrog, uh, you know, in some ways through the introduction of uh, Apple and iPhone. So the reason... Um, if I may, um, U.S. leapfrog was because there was no uh, colored phone in the U.S. market. So U.S. consumer actually went straight from a Nokia right to a iPhone. So I think that's exactly the same thing that's happening in many parts of the world, uh, in Asia especially, whereby you see that uh, in certain markets there isn't a very strong uh, banking financial market. So crypto was actually, uh, is actually the solutions to many of the, the use case. So where people have problems getting credit um, rating, so then they turn to a different objective. So I think one of the panelists said yesterday that was very interesting was that um, maybe uh, one of the best ways is to disrupt a market that doesn't have a incumbent. I think that, that might be why crypto is actually growing strong in places that we are not expecting. Uh, so one of the places that we got a lot of um, interest from is actually Venezuela. So a lot of Venezuelans want to have crypto to hedge against the local currency. So in that place, um, many people are buying our products so that they can have the last mile to go to a convenience store to acquire crypto or a pack currency. So, so I think that's, that's where uh, things get very interesting because we are essentially not replacing anyone. We are you know, um, just arriving and uh, giving the first service to the people. So that when, we, when we talk about a crypto winter and, you know, we look at the prices of cryptocurrencies, does that miss the point somewhat? Is that what you're saying? Is that it is um, proving its use case, just mm -hmm. maybe not here and not in the ways that, you know, investors sometimes like to look at? Yeah, so I mean, uh, last year there was so much focus on cryptocurrency, uh, the price, Everyone wants to get in. Um, I remember when I was in Davos um, the year before, so the, the whole focus was on cryptocurrency. If someone finds out that you are working in a cryptocurrency company, then you know they were like, oh, tell me more about it. But it's exactly different uh, today. So I think um, because the, the growth of the cryptocurrency price has been so evident, and you know some guys are trying to go into the IPO financial market, uh, some are raising money through uh, pure ICO, so I think that uh, it was a roller coaster ride. So, but I think the real focus is for companies that can do distribution and companies that can uh, tap into traditional uh, businesses or big companies that that can that we can work together with. I think that is like um, the focus uh, this year, really the use case and distribution. Right, and I know you guys are working with governments too, which is a really interesting side of it. Now, I want to ask both of you. Going away from QR codes, and that's certainly part of it, 
What is the future of payments? You see it all the time, probably more clearly than we do from the US because you're in these almost cashless societies. What does it look like five years from now? Are we paying with QR codes or are you just sort of walking through? I think Ajay from yeah. MasterCard was describing a scenario where you just get in your car and every the payment happens completely invisibly, seamlessly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I think it's you know different. It's certainly, different parts of the world are. It's it's not going. I don't think it's going to be consistent. You know, in five years across different geographies, for sure, based on the sophistication of the different payment systems in different regions and the adoption of technology, clearly. Um, however, um, I do believe, um, based on what is happening today, that um, things are going to be more seamless, right? So, checkout is certainly whether it's going to be, you know, based on your yourself, on your, you know, checking out through your person, or it's done on your phone. But certainly, what we do see happening is everything is getting consolidated, right? And so it, it is getting very much customized to the unique individual, right? So it's, things are happening where AI is really um, coming in in the sense that as things get consolidated where um, consumers are, or where, um, where more and more uh, partnerships get linked together from payment partnerships get linked together, so as the consumer starts to be able to check out more and more, um, through you know apps being connected to each other, that companies are able to basically leverage that um, to work together to be able to provide you uh, things that are more important to you versus to Zag versus to me to be able to give you more customized, um, more customized um, you know offer, offerings or promotions or whatever you need. So in other words, things are going to become very customized to the individual, and then the checkout is going to continue to be done in the back end via through a phone or through something that's on your person. Something else that you yeah. wear. Is it going to be a phone or do you think it's going to be something even more accessible? Is that just, is convenience king here? Um, I, again, it's, I, I, don't, I don't know if pay by face or pay by biometrics or pay by phone is going to, in five years, going to really be across all regions. Um, but certainly in some it will be, I think so for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, Zach, what are your thoughts? Um, I think, um, I mean, now relational database is everywhere, right? So uh, people don't talk about relational database because it's everywhere. So I think um, just like in a China market or Korea, Japan market, you don't really talk about uh, whether um, mobile payment is there because it's already there. So it's like a subconscious mind thing. So I mean, when I'm in China, um, I don't bring my wallet. Um, I, but I cannot not bring my mobile phone. Uh, ha not having my mobile phone for five minutes is actually like a pain because you, you pay your a car part um, using mobile phone, everything. So um, I left China, uh, I, I worked in China for a couple of years, so I left China f uh, two years ago. And I went back uh, last month and there was something that struck me, it was like the future. So I was, I was coming through the airport, um, going through the escalator, and there was this guy taking a photo of, of the car park, trying to pay his uh, car park uh, using Alipay um, or WeChat Pay, and then and another guy trying to book his uh, DD Uber uh, on the mobile phone. So everyone is u really using mobile phone. So I, I think uh, that is um, a kind of like uh, future uh, dawning, and I think uh, it might take a different form factor. It might take uh, the form factor of a mobile phone. It might take the form factor of, of a glasses. Uh, it might be using a uh, blockchain in the back end. I, I do believe that many things will become tokenized and it will be led by the big companies. Uh, the big companies are secretly doing a lot of tokenization, uh, blockchain stuff that they are not publicizing. So I think- Big companies here or big companies in Asia? Um, I think big companies uh, at, at both sides, yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Big tech in China, let's say, versus big tech here. You look at an application like Weixin or WeChat, right? And you can do virtually everything on it. You can book your doctor's appointment. You can do your grocery shopping. Book. You can go on Tinder. Whatever it is that you want to do is accessible there. Why do you think that the tech giants here um, haven't gotten into payments in a much bigger way. And on that note too, how did you view the Apple Goldman Sachs credit card announcement? It just seems so, um, what's the word, the polite way of putting it, maybe earlier on compared to what the tech companies are already doing in China. 
So in regards to a lifestyle app, you're right. So Alipay does enable you to be, pretty much spend 24 hours in the app, right? So movie tickets and transportation booking, your train, your flights, your, uh, your Diddy, as Zach mentioned, um, food delivery, checking your wealth management, you're right, everything. Um, and so, yeah, it is definitely a lifestyle app um, that you could do everything in and payments are attached. Um, prior to Ant, um, I was at Google, and at Google we were really focusing on trying to kind of crack this as well, right? Figure out how do you get more, um, how do you integrate more services into checkout, right, into payments. Um, but again, the, the system is so different. There are led, a lot of partnerships need to take place for this to happen, right? You need to connect with the entire ecosystem to really be able to connect all these various use cases. In the right? US. In the US, absolutely. And so that's transpired in Asia, right? There are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of partnerships that transpire in order to have all these use cases come together. Um, and so there's a lot of collaboration that needs to take place to foster that. And so I, that's necessary in order to provide this type of convenience and um, simplicity to consumers. Um, I don't think we're there yet here. I know we're not there yet in the US. Mm -hmm. Is that to the detriment of technology companies or the consumer, more importantly? And you know, there's obviously different philosophies when it comes to data privacy here and in the US. You can imagine if Facebook wanted to handle all of your bank data um, and book your Ubers and do everything for you, right? So is that holding the US back in some ways? Um, in so terms of moving towards a cashless society. No, so that, I mean, ensuring, you know, privacy and it, that's, all that is cons uh, consistent. You could still do all that without, and still collaborate and enable very strong use cases. As I said, you know, through everything is tokenized and secure and, and you don't necessarily need the sharing of information to be able to collaborate on some very sophisticated use cases to provide convenience to consumers to be able to transact all through one place. Okay, Zach, what do you think? Is privacy, mm. you know, that's not, not the differentiator? Are the apps in China as secure as the system is here? Um, I think, um, I read the magazine when I was flying here. Um, so I, I think um, one of the discussion about EU is that um, they are not uh, technology friendly, as technology friendly uh, as, as US because there's like uh, penalties for certain big companies there uh, for violating um, data privacy. So I think it's um, speed and stability um, is, is, is a um, compromise between speed and stability. Um, so I think um, as a more mature market, you want more stability. As in like if you have a family, you are an older person, you want more stability. And I think for um, um, the Asia market, the, the China market in specific, the focus is more towards speed uh, than stability. In, in fact, you can actually see that in um, software design philosophy. So um, I used to uh, work in a, a Norwegian Scandinavian company. So Scandinavian companies are more focused on stability. So the, the software life cycle is, is longer. So it takes a longer time to release the software. But um, in, in China, the joke is that, you know, um, you start writing your software development um, document when you start coding. So it's like, oh, I'm coding and I, I start writing the, the I mean, it's, it's an extreme um, anecdote, but I think, um, in, in developing market, uh, the need to move faster, the, the catching up uh, demand is actually higher. So I think that allows um, companies to, to move faster. And of course, when there's a pack of company moving very fast, there'll be several that are you know, um, left behind because of you know, security problems um, and stability. But I think there are companies that really uh, move uh, forward and also faster beyond um, um, the competitors. So I think that that is kind of like the, the software philosophy to move fast, break fast, a little bit like what Facebook has espoused uh, for good or for right. And uh, has for seen good or for wrong. the backlash, yeah. right? Yeah. Do you think that there will be any backlash in China? I know it's sometimes it's a trade-off between convenience and security, right? Is another way of sort of talking about this speed dilemma. Um, is there any indication that? Um, maybe Chinese consumers or you know Southeast Asian consumers have given away too much of their data and so to ads be clear, are coming. Yeah. So I just want to be clear. So from from our perspective, like users' security is paramount. Yeah. 
absolutely paramount. So, and, um, and so that is something that, you know, so there is no trade-off. I mean, when it comes to financial information, that's something incredibly sensitive, right? And so there is, you know, there's no tolerance for, certainly, like, we have to be fast and agile to ensure that, you know, we're, you know, we're building that, you know, the things that consumers want. At the same time, it is financial information. And I think and that's so, a good point, right? Because when we talk about QR codes versus cards, right? Actually, excellent point. Yeah. So QR codes are incredibly secure. So much. I mean. The QR codes are actually dynamic in that they change every 60 seconds, unlike a credit card that it's a static number that's out there and it's, it's, you know, it's, it could be fished, right? Whereas QR code, it's dynamic. Every 60 seconds, it changes. So if someone gets that, it's gone. It can't, it can't be used. It's, it's, it's gone in 60 seconds. So that's a really good point. I think the misnomer is that it's actually less secure. Yeah. Indeed, it's actually a lot more, more sophisticated secure. and a lot more secure, right? So I want to talk about Ant Financial's ambitions. They exist here in the U.S. Certainly, they exist on some level, sure. but there's some debate. Um, you, we were talking earlier how you're able Chinese tourists. You have to have a Chinese bank account. Are able to use their Alipay accounts all over the U.S. We yeah. talked about the New York sub, subway or taxi system yesterday. You use them um, down at Fisherman's Wharf. Do you guys talk about opening that up and making that available to people with U.S. bank accounts? Yeah, I mean, our focus is. There are 200,000 locations in the U.S. that accept Alipay. Uh, like you said, some are taxis. There are a slew of locations. Um, but it's uh, right now, it, it, our goal is to enable Chinese consumers, Alipay consumers, to be able to transact uh, anywhere they want to travel in the same way they do in China. And so that's what we're focused on. So there was a lot of talk yesterday about what But the what question, are we up to? <laughs> yeah, do we have? The question is, do you think about opening that up to, especially if the majority of people here are using cards, not uh, QR codes, and this is a more secure way? Doesn't it seem, why not open it up and yeah. bring in this massive market? Yeah. So yeah. So we. There's been a lot of like, you know, like people have said, hey, aren't you guys going? Or we'd like to have you here, but it doesn't. It's got to make sense, and it doesn't, it's, right now, that's not the goal. That's not what we're looking at. Who knows what the future brings? Brad, that's not what we're looking at right now. Brad Garlinghouse of Ripple actually yesterday said that um, you guys were absolutely focused right, I heard here that. and, yeah. you know, impl implied a little bit of world domination yeah. um, in there. Is it the regulations that would be, and um, the environment right now, particularly in the, during the Trump administration, um, you take a look, I know you say that you're not thinking about it right now, but yeah. you guys tried to acquire MoneyGram, yeah. remember? Um, and the environment wasn't right for it. So you may not be able to tell me particularly about your ambitions, but what are some of the things that Ant Financial thinks about? Yeah, so our, really we're, I mean, I don't know if we, so we as a technology company, the focus really is to, we have two partnerships with 250 financial institutions um, around the world, and so we really, do believe in collaboration mm -hmm. and uh, connecting with different institutions. Our focus right now is we are, we've kind of, we have an open, we've opened up our technical capabilities to help other financial institutions to really be able to benefit from some of the techn technical capabilities that we have. That is our focus. And so it's enabling our, our existing consumers. We have 700 million consumers in China. We have 1 billion consumers globally through our nine other mobile wallets that we have outside of China. Um, and also, we have incredible technical capabilities, that, and we've opened up our, um, our APIs to financial institutions, and we're helping them in China to augment their capabilities. That's our focus, um, and that, that's, what we're, that's really what we're doing right now. Yeah. Zach, uh, let me get your thoughts. Uh -huh. Do you think that the U.S. market um, is necessary for an Ant Financial, even though you know they may have a billion customers outside or a billion accounts mm. outside? Do you need to be here in the U.S. market? Um, so when I'm in China, I realize that um, there's so many things in Ant Financial products, Alipay. I mean, sometimes we forget that it's not. It has evolved beyond a payment. The payment is just. Uh, a means uh, to pay is 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 the credit. Um, I remember when uh, there was a blackout because I didn't pay my electric bills um, in, in Beijing. So I, I just used Alipay to immediately pay, and five minutes later, uh, the electricity came back. So I think there are a, a lot of convenience um, um, that Alipay and financial brings, and 
also to sort of like challenge or remind uh, the incumbent here that there right. are good services that, that is coming from different parts of the world that, that we can each learn from each other, yeah. Do you think that the traditional payments companies um, have their eye on you guys on Ant Financial and some of the, you know, com your company as well, Zach, what you're doing in Asia, there was some discussion yesterday um, with Tim Sohn and Ajay, and they sort of brushed off the Ant Financial threat a little bit, but how closely do you think they're actually watching, especially when you give us all these examples of how quickly and securely things happen? So, I mean, again, to as a reminder, we do. We, I mean, we partner here with, you know, we have partnership with First Data. Uh, we have per partnership with Verifone and Genico, um, with um, you know several partners across the ecosystem. So these are just a, yeah, a few that we've named. A um, few here in the U.S. We have partnerships with, uh, with you know, with Chase. With, yeah, with Chase. Um, acro but across the ecosystem, we and across the world, we do partner with, you know, prominent um, and you know. Important mm -hmm. players across the, the globe, and so, um, but like Zach was alluding to, there are a slew of different um, of different things that you know need to come together to to make sense to provide to consumers, um, and and you know again it's you know enabling the consumers to be able to our consumers in China to be able to transact where they go is really the focus. I mean I mean I truly can't express that enough. Is that that is. Again, we see more and more of our consumers that are traveling abroad every year. And so right now, it's like really we want to enable them to be able to transact using Alipay. And that is just right now because the form factor is QR code. And that is not, you know, there aren't, it's mostly, you know, NFC. When there is NFC, EMB is available. It's mostly card. There's still a long way to go <coughs> to be able to get, you know, QR code needs to be enabled. And so, not even a thought about what are we going to do next. No, the focus is just let's just get Alipay accepted so that our consumers that are traveling, we could service them wherever they want to be serviced. Have you, have you had challenges on the infrastructure side when you're making all of these places available to Alipay users? And that's why we partner with folks like Clover, like Point, like Ingenico, like Verifone, et cetera, to, and, and acquirers and so forth to uh, yeah, help us because the form factor is, it is different. It's a QR instead of right, um, a, a different form factor not usually used in the U.S. or Europe. And so, um, and so, yeah, so now more and more companies are actually, QR code is just native, right, in a lot of ways. Outside of Starbucks, I think that was one of the only places where QR code was really existed in, at a merchant location. Other than Starbucks, that was, uh, I think there was no other. Um, so, yeah, so it's something that we've been working on, certainly. Yeah, we've been talking about, you know, the U.S. heading towards more, becoming more cashless. Yeah. Um, it's been slow. Is there a tipping point? Is it the Apple wallet? What is that? What do you guys see that being? Zach, let's start with you. Um, so I think the tipping point will be when a big company, uh, a big, big company starts, um, f I don't know if forcing is the right word, uh, like uh, encouraging um, the consumer to use a uh, cashless payment system. So if, if that big company starts uh, doing it, Another big company says, hey, I'm, I'm, I need to be in the game as well. So that the other big company is also coming in. So I think that is the tipping point, uh, as we have saw in, in, in China, um, as, as we are seeing now in Indonesia. So Indonesia is now going through a tipping point at, at this very moment. So the, I was there like two weeks ago, and the other trip was like a month ago. So in that short span of one month, when you're in Jakarta, you actually see um, several. Uh, in fact, I think one is... Uh, and financial subsidiary uh, doing like 30% discount, 20% discount, which means that if you buy your McDonald's meal, you get straight off 20% discount using this Is payment system. But you get 30% off using that payment system. So when, when the war starts, I think that's the tipping point. Did that just kick off with Apple? Because Apple is so big, I know that companies uh -huh. like Square have, have been doing this already, but you know, the new Apple card, you get, I think, 3% back on Apple mm -hmm. products, 2% back. And I know it exists out there mm -hmm. in different forms, but packaged together, mm -hmm. um, do you think that could be? That yeah, could be? I think that surely uh, is, is the, the big push. Yeah, we, I know we're out of time, but I just wanted to ask because it's top of mind for me and for the network right now, we're talking, we're you know, up to our knees in IPO coverage. Yeah. Um, and Ant Financial used to be a name we talked about <laughs> often, and I think those plans got pushed back, but not necessarily, I know you can't say anything about whether you guys are looking at it, but how closely are you watching 
what's going on right now, these massive tech companies yeah. that have been private for so long finally tapping the markets and tomorrow with Lyft we'll get a really yeah. good indication of what investors think. So, you know, how are you looking at it? It's exciting. Like, I'm, yeah, it's really exciting to see what's going to happen tomorrow with Lyft. So, yeah, we're happy for that and it's, it's great. So, yeah, we don't have like a timeline on on anything on ours, but um, but yeah, no, I mean, certainly it's, it's just like an exciting time right now overall. Yeah. Zach, what do you think about um, IPOs, especially there's in Hong Kong just this week, right? Not a great story. Um, what's the company called, um, a crypto company that pulled its IPO at the last minute? How does yeah. that make you think of your business and, you know, your, your, your eventual goals? Yeah. So yeah, I think you're talking about, I guess it's Bitmain, um, so they just pulled up. So um, I think it really falls back to uh, two things uh, for us, or in fact, many crypto companies. Uh, one is getting the distribution. Uh, second is getting the real use case. So uh, my hope, and I believe, I don't know, in three years time, five years time, we'll be seeing uh, many big blockchain companies IPOing. Uh, so like marrying the traditional financial market with uh, the blockchain um, company. So I think, that's what we hope, and, and I think it will be proven through a real use case and distribution, uh, not just a hype. Yeah. Got it. Well, please help me in thanking Carol and Zach for today. Thank, Thank you. you guys.